Hi, my name is Mark Watson, and I'm the CEO of Earth Innovations. A few years ago, our family dog Grover and another dog on our street suddenly died from a lymphoma cancer that was linked to the toxins found in road salt. This traumatic family event, as sad as it was for our young children, was a catalyst that led me to develop EcoTraction, an environmentally friendly alternative to road salt. There are many environmental issues affecting our planet, but few are as directly linked to our personal choices as road salt. Perhaps after watching this video, your perspective on this seemingly innocent chemical will change, and you too will become part of the solution. Like it or not, winter comes along every year. With it comes the extra hassle of having to shovel our driveways and commute to work through snowstorms. And along with winter comes a huge pile of salt. It seems like, here in North America, we've been brainwashed into believing that if we throw huge amounts of road salt and ice melters around, we can melt winter away and defeat Mother Nature, if you will. Did you know that in Canada, they use about 10 million tons of road salt every year for highway de-icing? If you add that to the 30 million tons of salt that get used every year in the United States, it means that nearly 40 million tons of salt get used every year in North America alone as we attempt to deal with our winter woes. What does 40 million tons of salt look like exactly? Well, one 18-wheeler truck will hold about 25 tons of salt. That means it would take 1.6 million 18-wheelers just to hold all of the salt that gets used in a single year in North America. If you were to line up those salt trucks bumper to bumper, you'd have a line of salt trucks that was 86.4 million feet long. An NFL football field is only 300 feet long. So if you think about it, that line of triaxles would stretch across almost 288,000 NFL football fields, or 60% around the world. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, what's the big deal with that? After all, isn't salt a natural substance that just sort of disappears when spring arrives and the snow melts? All those spring showers are just nature's way of cleaning up all the grime and salt associated with winter, right? Well, all of that salt that we dump on our roads and sidewalks gets washed away, but it doesn't just vanish. Those 40 million tons of salt have to end up somewhere, and that somewhere is our soil, our rivers, and ultimately, our drinking water. You see, salt doesn't decay, it doesn't break down, and it certainly doesn't just go away. It dissolves into the snowmelt and then flows into our storm sewers. From there, most of it enters our waterways. Every ton of salt contaminates 1.64 million liters of water. That's roughly 433,000 U.S. gallons. If we use 40 million tons of salt annually in North America, then we're contaminating 15.625 quadrillion liters or 4 quadrillion U.S. gallons of water. That's enough water to fill up Lake Superior, the greatest of the freshwater lakes, 1.3 times over. For the most part, this water is completely untreated. So all of these dissolved salts are ending up in the water that we drink. Sure, our drinking water gets treated prior to consumption, but sodium chloride and other chloride salts cannot be removed by conventional water treatment. According to David Suzuki, a single glass of Toronto tap water contains 10 billion billion chloride ions of salt. So much for keeping to a sodium-restricted diet. And you know what happens to the last little pile of dirty snow that's sitting on the side of your driveway? Well, whatever salt doesn't run off into our rivers winds up getting absorbed into the soil where it accumulates year after year. It destroys the soil structure and eventually ends up in our groundwater table. Once the salt has found its way into the water table, as it has in Waterloo, Canada, for instance, the water table is permanently contaminated. The salt will continue to accumulate for generations to come. It can be diluted, but can never be permanently removed. So maybe it's worth our while to take a closer look at the whole road salt issue. Let's back up for a second and take a moment to set the record straight about who we are. We're Earth Innovations. As a company, we're committed to developing and marketing eco-friendly products that will help protect our precious natural resources. Obviously, as the producers of EcoTraction, an eco-friendly alternative to road salt, we've got something at stake in the issue. But at the end of the day, we all have something at stake in this issue. Because we all inhabit this planet, and none of us are immune to the effects that road salt has on our aquatic biosphere. That's our streams, our rivers, our lakes, our groundwater, and ultimately our drinking water. 
and a terrestrial biosphere that soils and plants and trees. And as taxpayers, none of us are immune to the effects that road salt has on the green and gray infrastructure, such as trees or roads and bridges, that make our cities what they are. In economics, we call this externalized or hidden cost. As taxpayers, we haven't consented to the extra hidden costs that are associated with road salt, but we still end up paying for them. Each ton of salt causes an estimated $900 in damage to our urban and rural infrastructure. So is it really accurate to say that we're only paying $60 a ton for road salt? That's only the upfront cost that we pay. It doesn't account for the salt debt that we incur every year. The real externalized cost of road salt is $960 a ton. Multiply this by 40 million tons, and collectively in North America, we have a $38.4 billion problem. And to make matters worse, it's a problem that repeats itself every year. One of the big myths about road salt is that it's cheap. According to the Salt Institute, the self-proclaimed foremost source of authoritative information about salt, salt is the de-icer of choice for its quick action, economical cost and ease of use, Dozens of other de-icer products are available, but none has matched salt's cost-effectiveness. Well, it's cost-effective, all right, because the little that we spend up front costs us so much further down the line in terms of damage to infrastructure, vehicles, clean water, fish habitat, street trees, heck, nearly everything. Somehow, I doubt that's what the Salt Institute is referring to. We're told that there really isn't any viable alternative to salt. But is this true? Look at Scandinavia. They have extremely cold climates and lots of snow. And yet, in recent years, they've virtually kicked their salt addiction to the curb. And guess what? They don't have more car accidents, they have fewer potholes, longer lasting vehicles, and their environment is in better shape. Should we believe everything the Salt Institute is telling us? Let's take a minute to debunk the myth that salt is cheap. The most commonly used salt for de-icing purposes is rock salt or sodium chloride because it's promoted as being inexpensive. Now, road salt is not the same as purified table salt. Road salt is typically mined from million-year-old salt deposits, and these deposits naturally contain heavy metals such as lead, mercury, cadmium, and arsenic. When they pull the rock salt out of the ground, it tends to clump together, so they add ferrocyanide, which is sometimes called blue Prussian, to keep it from clumping. Ferrocyanide is a known carcinogen, and it was declared a human health toxic substance by Environment Canada. Table salt, on the other hand, gets purified, bleached, and iodized for human consumption. There is increasing evidence that links sodium chloride to some pretty adverse and expensive side effects, including corrosion of our motor vehicles, concrete walkways, interlocked brick patios, and public infrastructure. Ultimately, sodium chloride also has a negative impact on our health. The most common victims of road salt-induced corrosion, or rust, are automotive metals and rebar in bridges and parking structures. But at the end of the day, salt will eat away at everything. Approximately half of the nearly 600,000 bridges in the U.S. federal highway system have structural deficiencies or are functionally outmoded. According to U.S. Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, estimates, a quarter of U.S. bridge decks are badly deteriorated. According to the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, NACE, the main cause of concrete bridge deterioration is the use of road salts. The salts cause the steel reinforcing bars and other steel components supporting the bridge to corrode. Thousands of bridge decks built during the 1950s and 1960s are now contaminated with chlorides and are deteriorating. Repair and restoration of these decks, as they become deficient, will be a major expense for many years. And in some cases, the expense of deterioration is not just monetary. Are you starting to think that we've been misled about our collective salt debt? And that salt isn't as inexpensive as we thought? When we look at the added costs incurred by corrosion, it becomes pretty apparent that in the long run, we pay the price for the cheap rock salt we dump on our roads, sidewalks, and parking lots. We now know that road salt is responsible for damaging our roads, bridges, cars, polluting our water. But the fact is that our health 
and the health of the environment is being damaged as well. Most people consume three times more salt than they need to, without even trying. Not surprisingly, chloride levels in our waterways have risen as a result of increased road salt usage. And this is alarming because groundwater salinity is the primary concern for long-term potable water supply. As it is, the American Environmental Protection Agency requires that all public water systems monitor sodium levels and report levels greater than 20 milligrams per liter to local health authorities because at that level, physicians treating people on sodium-restricted diets have to advise them not to drink their own tap water. The water that we're drinking is contributing to health problems like hypertension because the salt that we're using to keep our roads clean is washing into our waterways and leaching into our groundwater. It's virtually impossible to remove 100% of the chlorides from our tap water on a municipal scale because of the high cost of advanced filtration techniques like reverse osmosis. As a result, most municipalities do the bare minimum. In 2001, Environment Canada and Health Canada released the Road Salt Assessment Report, which stated that the large quantities and concentrations of road salts entering the environment pose a significant threat to the web of life. That means it's harmful to plants, animals, birds, fish, lakes, streams, groundwater, and even our children. As a result of that report, Environment Canada and Health Canada had to declare all four chloride salts to be ecosystem toxic substances. Those findings automatically place chloride salts on the list of Class II priority substances. It's been nine years since road salt was first added to the Canadian priority substance list, and it still hasn't been classified as a Class I substance. Why? Because the salt industry and our government transportation agencies and organizations assure us that the science behind labeling road salt as toxic is flawed. They tell us that road salts do not pose a significant threat to the health of our environment unless they're used in excessive amounts. Well, I don't know about you, but I equate the words 40 million tons with the words excessive amounts. Until road salt gets recognized by the Canadian government as a Class 1 priority substance, municipalities, road authorities, and other users will have no legal controls over their use of salt, and very little will change in Canada. And until the road salt issue gains more traction in the U.S., even less will change in America. The 40 million tons of road salt that we use annually can no longer be rationalized as safe. The fact is that we are poisoning our future and those of generations to come. While our governments need to make some tough decisions on this issue, so do we. And if we make the change to a safer alternative to road salts, then we can proudly say that we've got it right. As the activist Margaret Mead said, never depend on institutions or governments to solve any problem. All social movements are founded by, guided by, motivated, and seen through the passion of individuals. To this end, if you share our passion for this issue, then please forward this link with a note to your local town councillor or federal politician. If you have any personal experiences with salt, photos, or facts to share with us about your town's own salt debt, we'd love to hear from you. Or whip out your phone and send us a video of how you got it right. Have a safe and snowy winter.